Good morning. Well, what a week. It has been a week of many significant dates and events, and I want to share them with you. It was so significant, in fact, that when I got ready this morning, I had on a bow tie. And then I stepped in front of Dandy, and she gave me a really awkward look, and I decided maybe that was a, a bit much. But, as you may or may not be aware, this morning marks a bit of a landmark occasion for us. Anybody know what that occasion is? On this date last year, I stood before you in view of a call, and I asked you to embrace a new vision that God had given for Indian Hills Baptist Church, and in kind, you all affirmed God's will in calling me as your pastor. Amen. Praise God for you. And the time flies, doesn't it? I received that call in trust and pledged to give my all to see this church flourish again for the glory of God. And a couple of things have changed since then. Some of you guys weren't here then. Our future was significantly less certain at that time. But among those things that have changed, my, my commitment to God's calling and my love for you have not changed nor has the vision or the passion that God has given me for this church and this community and his work here. I can tell you that I am even more convinced today than I was then that God has brought us here together for such a time as this. A couple other important dates passed this week. Dandy and I celebrated our anniversary on March 20th. That was personally significant. Which is also the first day of spring. But more significant to our purposes here this morning is that March 20th is the annual Jewish celebration of Purim. Maybe some of you are aware of that. The Jews have been celebrating this festival for 2,300 years now. It was celebrated in the time of Christ. Christ himself surely celebrated Purim as a devout Jew growing up in Israel. And this festival commemorates God's raising up of Queen Esther to save the Jewish people from a plot to kill all the Jews of ancient Persia. The book of Esther tells this story. It's a little bit of a strange book. It's definitely not a children's story, but it's loaded with ironic providential occurrences. And in an ironic twist of providence, the festival of Purim just happened to fall on the week that we find ourselves beginning our study of Esther and those events. Now, some might think nothing of it. Others might call that a coincidence. Others may be led to superstition. But what we learn in the scripture is that God is working a meticulous plan and no dates or events are random or coincidental. All that comes to pass comes by the providence of God and God is in control. And that's the underlying principle of the book of Esther. Despite the world's brokenness and despite any perceived absence of God, God is always at work. He's working all things together. And in Esther, we will see over and over that God works his plan for the good of his faithful people, even in places and times where it is difficult, if not impossible, to see him. God is always present, even if seemingly behind a veil of absence. I'm excited to be preaching Esther, because the modern church has typically avoided Esther, or they have relegated the book of Esther to ladies' Bible studies. I can tell you this is a message that men and women alike very much need to hear. This is an excellent word for the time in which we find ourselves. If you've been with us, you know we just finished studying Daniel. And throughout the book of Daniel, or throughout the book of Esther rather, we're going to learn that Esther is, in so many ways, the opposite of Daniel. For instance, Daniel's name means God is my judge. Daniel's a man who stands openly before God. The word Esther means hidden. This name was given to Esther to hide her Jewish identity. Further, where God gave direct revelation to Daniel, in the book of Esther, God appears to have hidden his face from the people. The name of God doesn't appear a single time within this entire book. Further, unlike David, who was born into nobility in Jerusalem, Esther was an orphan among the exiles who remained in Persia. Unlike Daniel, who was reared in Jewish traditions, Esther had no parents and no faith community and no solid rearing in the faith. She's one of those people who is Jewish because her parents were Jewish. We have no indication, however, 
that she grew up with any vibrant faith of her own. We'll see that where Daniel rose to prime minister of Babylon through his wisdom and his righteousness, Esther rose to be queen of Persia using her physical appeal. Daniel received dreams from God, and Esther, we'll see, at times felt abandoned and received no clear revelation. Daniel operated on unbending conviction, never bending in the face of death, but Esther's actions, we'll see, are cunning and prompted by a desire for survival. All told, Daniel was a man of no compromise, and yet, Mike Cosper points out that this profoundly compromised character, Esther, and her compromised cousin who raised her, Mordecai, they experience a kind of awakening. They make themselves vulnerable in their hostile culture, and their self-sacrifice leads to a miraculous redemption for the people of God. Not only are their lives spared, there is a kind of religious renewal that happens in God's work through them for the salvation of his people. See, what we're going to see is that Esther is a book about a woman who, without father or brother or husband, without being pure or holy or virginal, stands in the eye of an ego-driven, farcical, man-made, nearly catastrophic storm and acts to save God's people from destruction. Where Daniel is our model, so many of us are much more like Esther. Cosper goes on to point out that these days in our increasingly secularized world, Christian leaders are often pointing to the life of Daniel as a model for how we might make our way through dark times. But there's a problem with making Daniel our point of reference because Daniel lived the formative years of his life in Jerusalem. He was immersed in the habits and practices that define Jews as a tribe distinct from their neighbors. Cosper says, I don't think we can separate Daniel's acts of resistance his refusal to bow to idols or his refusal to give up his habits of prayer from these formative years. They gave him a firm ground on which to stand in contrast from the world around him. And so many of us, so many of the people we're trying to reach, have not been reared in the faith. For those of us who were, praise God, that is a blessing. But for so many, a huge amount of us and the people around us, we've been reared in the world. And God is someone that by His grace, we come to know. And His will in our personal faith is something that we come to learn. And that is Esther. Esther isn't this faithfully righteous girl who wins the heart of the king by her virtue. She's a profoundly compromised character born into a profoundly dark environment. She's born among the Persians to Jews who didn't return to Jerusalem after the exile. Yet God will show that He's faithful to care for His people there. He pursues His people. He protects his people. He calls his people out for his namesake. Cosper says this might just be the book we need for a time like ours. Esther's story is an invitation for anyone who finds themselves immersed in a hostile world, struggling with a sense of lost identity and longing for spiritual renewal. Esther confronts demonic evil with vulnerability and weakness, and while she lacks so many of the characteristics of Daniel, she and her cousin Mordecai, they practice a kind of resistance that not only improves the welfare of God's people, improves life throughout the kingdom of Persia, and they fulfill the mandate of Jeremiah 29, seeking the good of the city where they are. So where exactly are they? Uh, just to give us our bearings as to where we're at, and by that I mean where we're at geographically and also in world history, Throughout this Strangers in a Strange Land series, we've been working in chronological order through the events of the Jewish exile to Babylon. So we started this series in the time just before the exile at the Babylonian sack of Jerusalem right around 600 B.C. We followed Jeremiah up to the exile. The Jews were exiled to Babylon in 586. Then we followed Daniel through the 70 years of exile. And you remember King Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the statue of the, the four successive kingdoms, which were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome? Well, we saw Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar. Then we saw Babylon overtaken by Medo-Persia. The Persian king Cyrus in 538, he decreed that a group of Jews led by Zerubbabel would return from exile and go back to Jerusalem to build God's temple. Well, that group, they completed the rebuilding of the temple in 516. 516 is exactly 70 years from the date of the exile in 586. As an exact fulfillment of Jeremiah's prophecy. That brings us to where we are in Esther. In the early 5th century B.C., about 480 B.C., 
And Esther is among the vast majority of Jews who remained in the dispersion and did not return to Jerusalem. The book of Esther describes the events that happened during the reign of King Ahasuerus. This king is better known by the name you may recognize, which is his Greek name, Xerxes. He's the grandson of King Cyrus who cast Daniel into the lion's den. He inherited a massive kingdom, the largest kingdom the world had ever known, or yet known, far larger than Nebuchadnezzar's. Xerxes is probably most popularly known for being on the losing end of the Battle of Thermopylae, which is the famous Battle of the Greek 300. If you're familiar with that story, you know that 300 Greeks there, they stood in the pass and for days on end held off an uncountable number of Persian soldiers. This defeat at the hands of the Greeks, it was crushing to Xerxes. This takes place just before Esther enters the picture. I'm telling you all of this for a couple of reasons. Number one, I want you to know what's going on when Esther enters the picture. Second, I want you to understand where all of this fits into history. Third, in defense of our faith in terms of apologetics, it's important that we recognize the stories of the Old Testament are not folk tales, but they are woven right into the context of world history. For instance, secular literature, the history of Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar are well documented. Cyrus and his grandson Xerxes and the Persians are well documented. And Xerxes and Esther here, at this moment, are reigning at the time of the birth of the Greek philosopher Socrates. Esther becomes queen of Persia around 480 BC. Socrates is born in 469. After Esther, Nehemiah returns from Persia to Jerusalem. While Nehemiah is leading the rebuilding of the temple in Jer of the uh, city of Jerusalem, Socrates' pupil Plato is born in Greece. The point being that the history recounted in the pages of Scripture runs concurrently and is interwoven throughout the history of the world. You don't have to be a person of faith to know that these things actually happened. You just have to be an honest student of history. So just know, as Christians, we don't have any struggle placing the Bible in history. Now, returning to where we're at in our study of Esther, we're in the early 5th century B.C. Persia, around the year 480 B.C., where we find King Xerxes, referred to as Ahasuerus, here in our Bibles in Esther chapter 1. So let's begin reading the text together in Esther chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The inspired and inerrant, matchless word of God reads, now in the days of Ahasuerus, that's the Persian name of Xerxes, the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces, in those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in Susa, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, he gave a feast for all his officials and servants. The army of Persia and Medea and the nobles and governors of the provinces were before him. While he showed the riches of his royal glory and the splendor and pomp of his greatness for many days, 180 days, when these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in Susa the citadel, both great and small, a feast lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and violet hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rods and marble pillars and also couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and precious stones. Drinks were served in golden vessels, vessels of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished according to the bounty of the king. Basically, Ahasuerus, and I'm going to call him Xerxes because that's a name I, I can more easily say, had a ridiculously ornate palace in which he threw a ridiculously long party with a ridiculous amount of glitz and pomp. And in this, we're given some key insight into Xerxes' personality. We learned that where his grandfather, the good King Cyrus, the friend of Daniel, was a good and measured and thoughtful ruler, we will learn that Xerxes was not. Where Xerxes' military campaigns failed, he poured himself into massive building projects. Where his benevolence and virtue were in short supply, he threw endless, drunken, debaucherous parties. And this is just the first taste of what we'll see of the leadership of this man who was prone to emotional extremes and whose actions were volatile and often contradictory. Xerxes inherited the largest empire the world had ever known from Ethiopia to India, as the text says, over 127 provinces. History says he elevated himself to a godlike status among the Persians, and the people of the kingdom were to be his subjects. And as this scene progresses, we see Xerxes' poor character and his foolishness, they manifest in his interactions with his wife. 
you take a look with me at verse 10, we're told that on the seventh day, that being the seventh day of the seven-day party that immediately followed the 180-day party, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he was drunk, he commanded Mahuman, Biztha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Zether and Carcass, the seven eunuchs who served in the presence of King Ahasuerus, to bring Queen Vashti before the king with her royal crown, in order to show the peoples and the princes her beauty, for she was lovely to look at. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command delivered by the eunuchs. At this, the king became enraged, and his anger burned within him. So what we witness right here is Vashti's rebellion. Xerxes' queen, Vashti, has been summoned, and she is not coming. What the text says here is that Xerxes has commanded the eunuchs to bring her in her crown to show off her beauty. There's a number of commentators and traditions that suggest that there is something very inappropriate involved in this, that she is to be displayed in nothing more than her crown, to be objectified and paraded in a way that she was not comfortable with. So she refuses. And this king, Xerxes, who was recently defeated by the Greeks, a man who had set himself up as a god but shown himself only to be a defeated drunk, who was looking physically and mentally weak, is throwing these massive six-month-long parties full of pomp, but completely void of substance and real leadership. And he has, in his drunkenness, made a stupid and vulgar command of his wife, and in her refusal, he is now mortified. This king, whose vapid majesty is now on full display, who's already coming unraveled, now has been exposed as not even being able to keep his own home in order. It's becoming evident that he is losing all control. And as with so many things done in response to injury to one's pride or in humiliation, he reacts stupidly. Picking up in the text in verse 15, Xerxes asks his advisors, According to the law, what's to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of King Ahasuerus delivered by the eunuchs? Then Memekin, one of the king's eunuchs, said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only against the king has Queen Vashti done wrong, but also against all the officials and all the peoples who are in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will be made known to all women, causing them to look at their husbands with contempt, since they will say King Ahasuerus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she didn't come. This very day, the noble women of Persia and Medea, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will say the same to all the king's officials, and there will be contempt and wrath in plenty. If it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and Medes, so that it may not be repealed, that Vashti is never again to come before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So what we see here is this egregious overreaction, the feeling that there's a need to issue some sort of large-scale overwhelming decree to exert the king's authority over all women in the face of his embarrassment. And the text says that Vashti is never to be seen again. Hebrew tradition says that she was beheaded. The text doesn't confirm that. But we know in her rebellion, Xerxes was furious, and he has pretty much come unhinged. And it's into this chaotic cloud of darkness and wickedness that Esther enters. And we'll see that she herself enters the fray under a cloak of hiddenness and compromise. If you look with me at chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, After these things, when the anger of King Ahasuerus had abated, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what had been decreed against her. So he was regretful at this point. Then the king's young men who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought out for the king. Let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom to gather all the beautiful young virgins to the harem in Susa the citadel under custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women. Let their cosmetics be given them, and let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This pleased the king, and he did so. So when the king sobers up, after 187 days of partying, he realizes what he's done, what's happened to his queen, and so now he's remorseful and he's depressed. So his advisors, being concerned that he's now been militarily defeated, he's leading them into financial ruin, he's now without a queen, he's coming unraveled, the varnish is coming off, 
And this ruler who's supposed to be something like a god is beginning to appear inept and weak. So the king's advisors, they come up with this plan. This plan to get him back on his feet, to demonstrate his dominance and his divine power over his subjects. That plan involves him taking all the beautiful maidens of all the provinces, taking them captive, literally abducting them, taking them into his harem, so that he can spend the night with each one of them and choose his favorite to be his queen. And continuing in the text in verse 5, it says, Now there was a Jew in Susa the citadel, whose name was Mordecai, He's the son of Jair, son of Shimei, son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem among the captives, carried away with Jeconiah, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had carried away. He was bringing up Hadassah, that is Esther, the daughter of his uncle, for she had neither father nor mother. The young woman had a beautiful figure and was lovely to look at. And when her father and her mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So when the king's order and his edict were proclaimed, and when many young women were gathered in Susa the citadel in custody of Haggai, Esther also was taken into the king's palace and put in the custody of Haggai, who had charge of the women. And the young woman pleased him and won his favor. And he quickly provided her with her cosmetics and her portion of food, and with seven chosen young women from the king's palace, and advanced her and her young women to the best place in the harem. Esther had not made known to her pe- Esther had not made known her people or kindred, for Mordecai had commanded her not to make it known. There's a number of things to point out here. First of all being that verse 5 says there was a Jew in Susa, the citadel, whose name was Mordecai. We need to understand what's going on there. The fact that there is a Jew in Susa in the citadel is an issue. This means that not only has he not returned from the exile to Jerusalem, as he should have, but he has moved nearly twice as far from Jerusalem in the wrong direction. He's chosen to live in Persia, and he hasn't just chosen to live anywhere in Persia, not in some Jewish outpost, but he has made his way to the citadel of Susa, which is the capital and political heart of Persia. And he's taken a Persian name, Mordecai, which honors the Persian god Marduk. He's renamed Esther. He's changed her name from Hadassah to Esther so that her Jewish identity wouldn't be known. And he's commanded Esther to not let anyone know that they're Jews. So while they're of Jewish heritage, they had certainly compromised their identity as the people of God for the sake of making their way in this foreign land. Further, while Mordecai's raised up Esther as his daughter, we see no attempt by him to resist the king's decree to try to hide Esther. Instead, we see him instructing Esther that she should do everything that she's told to do to participate in everything that's requested of her, to make herself as pleasing as possible to both the leader of the harem and to the king. This is the exact opposite of the approach of Daniel. Daniel, in his conviction, wouldn't compromise his practices in Hebrew identity, and he clearly stood out. But instead, what we see with Esther, not a dependence on the Lord or a persistence in prayer or acting in conviction, but an attempt to hide her identity, do whatever seemed pragmatically advantageous in order to place herself in whatever was perceived to be the most advantageous position, such that she'd be able to get to the king and please the king in hopes that she'd be raised up into the position of queen. And in all likelihood, she was actually going to end up in the same position as all the other captives, as concubines. Verse 14 tells us, that each of these women, after spending an evening with the king, if they were not chosen to be queen, they'd end up spending the rest of their lives as the king's concubines. They'd never have a life of their own or have opportunity for a family. So this is a very compromising situation to be walking headlong into, and it's awkward that rather than grieving or resisting, they are plotting. There's no indication that they cried out to the Lord or called upon him to intercede or to guide or to seek out his will. In fact, we know that nowhere in the book of Esther is there any mention of God at all. And in all of this, we see the complexity of these characters. There is a lot going on within these two. It's interesting to read some of the evangelical literature alongside the Hebrew commentaries on this text because where many of the evangelical commentaries attempt to flatten out Esther, to to paint her as this righteous and virtuous hero, 
the Hebrew commentaries are very honest about the complexity of her character and the conflict that's going on within this story and that's going on within her. And what's going on here is that Mordecai is a compromised and hidden Jew, packaging Esther, his niece, as a compromised and hidden Jew to pragmatically secure an outcome that they have never stopped to consider if it be God's will. And Mike Cosper, who is a fantastic evangelical pastor, writer for the Gospel Coalition, he says that just as we're tempted to flatten out Esther and Mordecai, like Jacob and Joseph of Genesis, into two-dimensional heroes, we'd like to do the same with ourselves. We want to tell simple stories about ourselves, and it'd be easier to grasp that we're either sinners or we're saints than it is to acknowledge that we are a mix of both. And the truth is our own motivations are as much a black box as Esther's. We're a mystery to ourselves, tangled in cultural practices and ways of thinking that we don't always objectively see. The reality is that we are sinners saved by grace. What this should all lead us to is the acknowledgement that in God's redemptive story, we are not the heroes, but Jesus is. We are not perfect saints, and Jesus said no one is good but God. We need to acknowledge that our entire dependence and our only hope is on God alone. This story should bring hope for us all, because what we're beginning to see unfold in the story of Esther and her being brought into the king's pres uh, presence, and I'll spoil the ending for you, God's going to do an amazing work through her, and we see that beneath the surface of all that's transpiring in this story is the hidden providence of God. Even despite all of Xerxes' wickedness, the Lord is working good. Even in his stupid command of Vashti, and in her resistance, and in the king's casting her out, and in his gathering to himself all the beautiful maidens, even in the absence of miracles or supernatural revelation, as Aviva Zornberg points out, there were no natural laws set aside, no seas split, no barren wombs giving birth, no prophets speaking in the name of God. But God was calling out and raising up his chosen person to bring the redemption of his people to fruition. Because we see that upon meeting Esther in verse 17, chapter 2, the king loved Esther more than all the women, and she won grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. God worked in this broken mess and placed Esther before the king such that he would fall in love with her and make her his queen, and later she will be the instrument that will bring about the salvation of his people there in Persia. Two big things we see in this. First, God knows Esther's not perfect, but she is his chosen vessel, and God takes up crooked pencils, and with them, he draws perfectly straight lines. And brothers and sisters, if you think you are too broken to be used of God, it is not too late to repent and give yourself to him and trust in Christ and to know that you are not too broken to be redeemed and you are not too broken to be useful to God. The second thing to know is that even in the grit and ugliness of a place like this where God is seemingly hidden and his goodness and glory and presence are veiled in this darkness, God is at work and God is there. Behind this shroud of darkness, God is there. There's a Christian artist named Andy Menio who tells this great story where he says, I had this moment when I was on a plane. I was at LGA getting ready to take off. And it just looked gloomy and dark and there's thunder and lightning. I didn't even think we were going to take off. And then we started to take off and the pilot was like, brace yourself, there's going to be some turbulence. We started going through the clouds and everything was shaking and I thought we were going to die. But when we got through the clouds, we got up above the clouds, it looked like California. It was sunny, bright, beautiful. It was like I had almost forgotten for a second that the sun even existed. I had this moment where I was like, the sun is still here. It was still here the whole time. I just couldn't see it. And this experience spoke to me. There's a song that's written by a famous poet and hymn writer, William Cowper, that explains this same beautiful truth so well. It says, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. 
deep and unfathomable minds of never-failing skill. He treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break in blessing on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. Esther is a broken person, but she isn't too broken to be used of God. And at times in her story, you'll see she feels abandoned and she doesn't get clear direction. As if she's living in a shroud of darkness. And yet God is there working providentially on her behalf. God works in the lives of and rescues sinners. And God works in places where his existence isn't readily seen. Despite the world's brokenness and despite what feels like God's absence, God is at work and God is raising up a people to fulfill his plan. And in Esther, we will see over and over that through ironic and unexpected reversals, God is working for his glory and the good of his faithful people. Even when God seems absent, we can trust he is right there. And Esther, imperfect as she is, was called of God. When the time comes, she'll rise to the occasion. By faith in God, she will save the Lord's people. She reminds us that there is a perfect Savior who never sinned, who saved us not just from death, but from eternal damnation and separation from God. And today, if you recognize that you too are imperfect, that you, like me and like all of us, are a sinner, and you are ready to rise up and follow Christ because you recognize your need of Him, then during this next song, I ask you to come forward, give your life to Christ and trust in Him for your redemption. If you're ready to walk faithfully with this church, to sacrifice with this church, join us in membership as we stand together and follow Christ together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for examples like Esther, who are not like Daniel, and yet are people used of you, redeemed by you, by your grace, and made heroes of the faith. Father, I know who I am, I know who I've been, and I pray that each person in this congregation would search your hearts and acknowledge who you are and who you have been and recognize that even while we are broken, God desires us and he will use us and that also our only hope is in the saving work of Jesus Christ. It's by the aid of your spirit and the matchless authority of your son, Jesus Christ, to you, Father, we pray. Amen.